I'm going to now talk a little bit about difficulties with CTG interpretation. So, so what is the terminology BIF1 and BIF2 and it was used by whom? The Americans the, or the? The Americans British. used DIP1 and DIP2. Now we don't use the terminology anymore. So that is actually type 1 and type 2 or DIP1 and DIP2. We call it early. DIP1 is early. And DIP2. DIP2 is late deceleration. We use nearly 60. For yeah, 50 to 60 percent of mothers are monitored inter by intermittent auscultation. Are supposed to be low risk. Yeah, but we are trying to improve the practice because cases which are missed are really uh, some in the low risk category. If, if it is high risk, then we use the field monitoring throughout labor. Hello. <coughs> okay, so, so I'm going to go very quickly because the time is going to be short. Um, the intraparta morbidity, which I mentioned about each baby counts, was not only due to asphyxia, but also due to trauma, and also due to infection. Infection is one of the commonest things which damages baby in labor. And still, we don't know how best to manage infection in labor. And sometimes it can be a combination of the above. The baby, the mother has temperature in labor, has decelerations, then we do an operative delivery and the baby runs into trouble. So we had to know a little bit about that. This is a picture I showed you before about the Kester report. So I'm going to go through inability to interpret the CTG, failure to incorporate the clinical picture, and if time permits on delay in taking action and poor communication. Now we all study about medical condition, diabetes, hypertensive disease, SLE and so on. The Kesti report pointed out it's time we focus on the baby because the baby is the center of the fetal surveillance and these are the conditions the baby has a poor reserve. So with the given CTG trace, if you have any one of these conditions, the baby will get acidotic three times faster. So preterm, postterm, very simple to remember. Growth restriction, thick meconium with scanty fluid, intrauterine infection, and intrapartum bleeding. Now the explanations are very straightforward. If there's intrapartum bleeding, there is separation of the placenta, which reduces the placental surface. Secondly, the blood seeps into the myometrium and causes irregular contraction, and the baby gets hypoxic much quicker. So depending on the type of bleeding, whether it is due to placental separation or due to other causes. Infection is a major problem for two reasons. One is when the mother shows temperature and there is evidence of chorioamnionitis, there is already inflammatory products in the mother's blood. That means she has tumor necrosing factor, interleukin, and when there is hypoxic cell damage, the infective material or the products of infection like tumor necrosing and interleukin causes more damage. The second reason why infection causes problem is their metabolic rate is much higher. If I'm going to run from here to the road, that's the point I get hypoxic. If I have a bad flu, halfway down I'll get tired because I use more oxygen to burn off as calories and generate heat. And on top of that, somebody is going to block my nose and mouth like a cord compression, I'll get acidotic even faster. So infection is not a good thing. Thick meconium with scanty fluid has been recognized from Aristotle's time, who said babies with thick meconium and scanty lipo don't do well. They are born flat at birth and they don't do well. The thick meconium is not the issue, but the quantity of lipo is important because most lyqua term is due to the amniotic fluid and the amniotic fluid is due to the renal perfusion. If the whole bed sheet is wet and there's thick meconium, that's a function of maturity. You don't have to worry so much. But if you are to take the pad gently and see there is thick meconium, like pea soup meconium, that's the worry because that baby doesn't have enough lyqua and it can aspirate the meconium, which is gelatinous or pea soup and cause meconium aspiration syndrome. So pea soup or gelatinous meconium with small quantities of worry. In National Maternity Hospital in Dublin, they have universal containers where the midwife or the doctor is to collect the fluid and keep it on the bedside locker. So if you don't see any fluid, that means that is dangerous as well. It is called dry labor. 
If you have thick meconium, very little in the bottle, that is not good. But if there's plenty of fluid full with meconium, it's not an issue. You can look after the baby provided the trace is okay. IUGR is an issue, intrauterine growth restriction. It depends on the size of the baby. If one room is 2.4 at 37 weeks, next room is 1.834. The 1.81 1 .1 will have a smaller placenta, more cotyledons will be pale and infarcted. So when the deceleration starts, the one which is much smaller will run into hypoxia and acidosis faster. So the size, estimated fetal size will tell us. Post-term, there is an indifferential perfusion of placenta to the baby, and the babies tend to get hypoxic much quicker if the deceleration starts. So again, you have to observe them very carefully. In preterm, if they get hypoxic and acidosis, hyaline membrane disease comes on very quickly, and they don't do very well. So you don't waste much time with preterm. What, what Kesti also mentioned is a combination of these ones. That is, a preterm baby comes at 32 weeks with rupture membranes, clear lycoa. Next day, a baby passes.